So you have questions about ecosystem marketing, carbon programs, nitrogen reduction programs. In fact, you have asked me those questions. I commonly hear those questions. So you know what I did? I said, I'm going to bring on people who can answer these questions for you. That's what we're doing today in this episode of the Business of Agriculture. Hey, Damian Mason here with a question before we hop into this episode of the Business of Agriculture. If you farm for a living, you employ a lot of amazing technology from your inputs that you put into the soil to the tractor that you sit in, your combine, the amazing data that it harvests. But has your soil analytics kept up technologically with everything else in your farming operation? I would venture to say that no, it is not. Sure, you check for your nitrogen, your phosphorus, your potassium, your micronutrients as well. But what about disease pressure? Do you know what diseases and what pests you're going to face next year? No, you don't. But you can now figure that out with Pattern Ag's predictive analytics. Think about it. They can tell you now with testing what the likelihood of facing nasty diseases, things like cyst nematode or uh, sudden death syndrome, what the likelihood of you having this in your field, then you know how to prepare, how to treat, and where to invest your money. It's using technology to make you bigger yields and therefore make you bigger money. Go to www.pattern.ag to learn more. They are pioneering the way in predictive agronomy. Hey there, welcome to the Business of Agriculture. It's me, Damian Mason. You knew that. You heard that in the introduction. We got a great show for you today because we are answering some of the questions, some of the skepticism that is out here in the world of agriculture. We're talking about ecosystem marketing. We're talking about taking your land and signing it up for a program where you will get money to reduce your uh, nitrogen use, where you will can get paid to put more carbon into your ground. These carbon programs have been around for a while. You know about some of the companies, uh, some of them that might be like named after a color uh, was one of the first ones to be out here. And it had a tremendous amount of sort of questions. What the hell is this? Why are companies doing this? And so I brought on people that can answer all these questions for you. More importantly, I brought on people that can talk to you about why they are investing in agriculture to do environmental programs. I've got Tim Meinhold and Laura Kowalski from a company called Premiant. They're going to tell you who Premiant is. And they do fund programs through Truterra. As you know, Truterra is one of my sponsors. I've got Greg Allard. He is with Truterra. Greg and I had drinks in Omaha. And I said, you know what, let's get this thing done. So here we are. We're bringing on people to talk about this. First off, Truterra is my sponsor. We know that, Greg. You are the conduit uh, between a company like Premiant and me, the farm owner, to get me paid to do things that are good for my ground and the environment. Go ahead and take it to the next level. Correct. So, yeah, we're, we are. And, and Damien, I think you said it best. Our, we, we look at the grower as our customer, and we want to connect the grower, our customer, to companies like Premiant who are looking to invest in their supply chain and, and really bring that whole business of regenerative agriculture to life. And I, I know that's somewhat of a, a new term, or uh, maybe even folks don't like that term sometimes. But for us, it, it's which really term, about- Which term do they not like? Sometimes we, we get a little flack on the regenerative uh, agriculture. We, you know, conservation agriculture maybe uh, fits better in certain circles. But, uh, yeah, sometimes we, we catch a little bit of, of heat on the whole regenerative agriculture terminology. Um, but, but, yes, Truterra is an intermediary connecting companies like Premiant who are looking to uh, simply make improvements in their supply chain. And, and they want to be able to take that, uh, talk about it, uh, improve that supply chain. But they also know... Uh, most importantly, that none of that happens without work on the ground with with our growers, with these customers of ours. So, so Tim and Laura, uh, yeah, so the, the the idea here is, and we've covered this before, dear listener, True Terra is the conduit. They're a spinoff of, no, spinoff, they're a division of Lando Lakes. And the idea is they have people like Greg out here getting acres signed up for programs that are funded through companies like Premiant giving money for this. So we're going to talk about Premiant. We're going to talk to Tim and Laura. First off, before we get into you guys doing this and why you do it and how you go about doing it, I want to talk about what Premiant is. Because you are, you know, we hear this in ag, like uh, my buddy Kelly Garrett in Extreme Ag, he got paid from like Shopify or Spotify. You know, it's like, okay, some tech person wanted to give money to feel good about their carbon footprint. But you are actually in the ag space. Premiant is an agricultural company. And you're now, you're not, you're not, you're not a West Coast tech venture that's uh, doing this. You're, you're an ag company. Yeah, correct. We, uh, we're in the U.S. corn wet milling space. Uh, the company's been around for for over 100 years, dating back to the 80s daily manufacturing days. 
uh, to Tate and Lyle until uh, to Premium here in the last 15 months. Um, we take corn and we turn it into starch. We turn it into ethanol. Um, and we use the byproducts uh, generated from our corn processing to, uh, to feed animals, to feed pets. Um, we, uh, you know, I grew up on a farm. I'm a, I'm a big believer in, in what we're attempting to do as a company, <clears throat> listening to the consumers, our customers, about getting more involved in sustainability. Uh, I've got three kids in their 20s, and uh, this is first and foremost on their mind. And, uh, you know, we've, we've been involved with Truterra for the last five years. Every single acre we have is enrolled in this program. Uh, roughly wait, wait, no, we say we, you're say, we say we as the Meinhold family, not we as in Premier. You're talking personally. No, 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 no. We as in Premier. So I wish the Meinhold family had 1.2 million acres, but uh, we as Premier are enrolled uh, uh, in this program and have been for the last five years. Are you saying you don't have 1.2 million acres in the family farm? Not, not the last time I checked, but uh, yeah, we uh, we farm about a thousand acres corn and soybeans. And uh, my brother that I have, that's a year younger, me took over the family farm. I myself made the de decision when I was young, in my early 20s, that uh, I was more interested in the uh, the procurement, the marketing, the trading aspect of of the family farm operation and not as interested in the production side, yeah. which my brother dearly loved. And um, yeah, so I find myself working in the ag space here for the last uh, 30 some years. So Premier used to be A.E. Staley. Some of us that spent time in a place called West Lafayette, Indiana, are very familiar. Uh, you, you, you smelled it before you saw it on Highway 52, the corn processing facility, A.E. Yeah. Staley out in uh, Lafayette. Anyway, so 1.2 million acres. That means your customers. The, the you buy corn off of 1.2 million acres. Is that what I'm understanding? And That's so, correct. and then tell me. Then you said all those acres are signed up through True Terra for one of these programs. And I think Laura maybe can help me out on this. So tell me how this works. Yeah. So, you know, the start of the program, we're really customer centric organization, right? So, you know we started to get engagement from our customers that were getting pressure from consumers to start thinking about sustainability and, and building a resilient supply chain, right? And so we came to Truterra, we designed this program, we had some customers that were really eager to be in with us, but we made the decision to be a leader in this space. And like Tim said, enroll all 1.2 million. So we do have customers that then kind of enroll their part of what they're buying from us. So we buy 1.2 million acres of corn, we grind it, that goes on to the customer, right? So they they can then own a chunk of that, right? And so the way it works with Truterra is Truterra assigns specific acres down to the county level that our customers then enroll and those are their acres. That's where they get the data from it. And you can help drive practice change on the ground using Truterra's tools um, and all of that. But um, we don't have customers enrolled at all 1.2 million. We've decided that that's a leadership position that we're going to take and then to continue to bring our customers along on that journey with us. Yeah. So uh, again, I want to, there's a lot of skepticism and a lot of questions and this is, it's, it's not, it's, it's murky. It's opaque. It's not like we're in a blind cave, but you know, this thing has still been a little bit out there for a lot of people in ag at all levels, you know, our level to producer level, whatever. So I want to, I'm a corn farmer here in Indiana, uh, corn and bean farmer. I sell my stuff through you, the former Staley company. Premium is where I take my stuff. Okay. That's, I'm, I just want to make sure that I'm explaining this to the person. Remember, I always use the example. What if I'm a cranberry processor in, in Connecticut listening to this? I want to understand how this all works. I'm a corn producer here in the Midwest. I, I sell my corn to you because you use it then, you know, ethanol uh, and, and uh, you know, feed products, et cetera, what corn gets made into. And then you say, yeah, but you know what? <clears throat> we want you to participate and do some things that are positive for the environment and sort of heading down the road of regenerative agricultural practices. And so to be to be one of our providers, one of our suppliers of corn, uh, you're going to adhere to this. Have you got any blowback at the farmer level saying, I will just go and sell my stuff somewhere else. So I'll take a step back. It's impossible to trace a grain of corn through an entire supply chain, right? So we take a supply shed approach where we enroll the equivalent amount of acres in. We're not telling every grower that shows up to our grain elevators that they have to go enroll in Truterra. 
Truterra is engaged through the retailer, and Greg can obviously talk more about kind of that end of it. But then we in, we're trying to change the entire industry in theory, right? We need to make some moves to these regenerative pra practices. We know that for soil health, for many other things, right? And so we're trying to shift the industry and kind of graduate growers through this program. They can okay. dip their toe in with Truterra, use their tools to see if I make this practice change, how does that impact my yield? How does that impact my profitability? And then they, you know, in theory, drink the Kool-Aid, realize that this is the right thing to do for their land. And we continue to enroll more growers through that program so that they can continue to drive those practice yeah, changes. When my, right? semi, when my semi comes into your plant, uh, is there still the plant in Lafayette, presumably? Yes. yes there is. So when I pull my semi into Lafayette, you don't run out there and say, wait a minute, this did not come from one of our signed up acres because obviously corn, it's a commodity, right? Number two, yellow corn is a commodity. So I get what you're saying. So what you essentially said, Laura, is we, we consume the equivalent of about 1.2 million acres worth of corn, you know, in aggregate. And we're going to then make sure that we get 1.2 million acres somewhere in the United States signed up uh, into these programs. That's what I'm hearing. And then you, chicken or the egg question, <clears throat> you said our customers, and that means the folks that buy after it's been processed by you, <laughs> yeah, they're buying it for everything, for ethanol, for, for cornstarch, for, you know, animal feed, whatever. You had those customers, some of them said, we want to be, we want to build a dim. Is it because they cared about their customer because their customers, why did they, why did, why do they care? Why do they give two hoots in hell about those acres being signed up? Yeah, I mean, it, it goes to Tim's point early on, right? It's the pressure from the consumer that we know the consumer's putting pressure on our customer. We're, we're the B2B, the business of business behind the scenes, right? And so those consumer brands are getting that pressure. Then they're coming to us saying, how can we work with this, build a more resilient supply chain, be able to understand the data, right? It all essentially comes back to carbon. They want to understand what's the carbon impact of their supply chain, and so they work with us through this program to kind of distill everything down to that single metric for mm -hmm. for the storytelling piece of it, right? Yeah. So but essentially, and that's why it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing. And that's why I threw it out there. By the way, Greg, I, you'll appreciate this. Uh, we'll get to you in a second. It's a chicken or the egg thing. In other words, we all work for other people. It's one of the big points I make in my business speeches and whatnot. We all work for, uh, uh, so you know, every dollar you're going to make the rest of your life is someone else's dollar right now. So the you have a customer that buys your cornstarch. Well, they then turn it into something that goes to a customer. That end customer or the person that they want to be able to tell the, the person that shops or they want to be able to put an ad out, they want from a public relations standpoint and a, uh, and a promotional, really, they want to be able to say, here's what we're doing. Is, is that it? Is it it's the pressure to be able to comply? Is it to be able to go to the consumer and say it? Or is it to go to their shareholders? Where do you think the pressure came from that made them uh, come back to you and say, let's let's do this? Okay. Uh, Greg. So, Greg, Greg, Greg was getting ready to answer it. Yeah. Um, if you're listening, if you're driving down the road or in your tractor right now, commonly Laura and Tim look at each other before they can answer. They're almost <laughs> like a like an old married couple where they think <laughs> they have to seek permission from one another. Greg, answer the question. Where do you think the where do you think the impetus comes from to get signed up for a program through Truterra? I mean, because you're talking about there's like six layers before we get to the farm. Yep. Uh, and, and it's all of the above, Damien. I, I think that if you follow that through, so what we commonly term as upstream where the grain originates all the way downstream, which could be that very end consumer that's at the retailer pulling it off the shelf. And I think where that's coming from is, is all of the above. Then you dive into some of these organizations and it's even a, a recruiting factor that there's some sort of sustainability program that this company invests in that helps attract uh, young interns to, to be able to sign up and say, yes, this is the company I want to be a part of. So shareholders, yes. Consumers, yes. All of the above, as I mentioned, is is truly the answer. And I'll let Laura tack on anything from uh, from your end too. Wait a minute. She'll need to yeah, turn. I mean, she'll need to turn and look at Tim to decide if she can <laughs> answer the the query. I would say the consumer is going to be the biggest driver, right? Just like for us, we're a customer centric organization. So are our customers, right? They're also looking to the consumer to drive this. It's why it's stayed for so long because the consumer continues to be engaged on this. And so that's where their pressure comes from. And that's where 
it continues to flow upstream to us, right? And then we engage with Trutera, who continues to, like you said, the six layers down the uh, down the chain. Laura, I think it's cute. You've said customer centric about two or three times already. I think that that's kind of a, a buzzword in, in corporate. But here's the reality, and I and I'm I'm wise appling, but I'm kind of only wise appling. The truth is, you know, those of us that have been service providers, I, I'm starting my 30th year right now. If you're not customer centric, at some point you don't have a business. And I've always also often pointed out to my ag people that we're the least at production ag. We're still still even beginning to comprehend that. You know, like my ag people still think, well, sons of bitches ain't going to tell me how to do what I do. And and that's not going to work moving forward. I don't think. I think there's consumer pressure. There's going to be, you know, we talk about like source verified. Talk about, I want to know how my food is grown. You get the Walmarts of the world that are like starting to say, we're going to verify where this stuff comes from. So I think that what you're saying is actually something that's not been talked about much in production agriculture until like the last year. <laughs> Am I right? Tim, you can answer that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, I, I think, um, and you alluded to this a little bit earlier, you're looking for market differ differentiation, right? Is this something that 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 sets me apart from my competitor? Is this something that sets me apart from um, from another producer, right? And I and I think it kind of bottles up from there on how you can differentiate maybe your your farm versus uh, versus. Uh, another person's farm right and and i think we're starting to get that momentum back to to what laura said earlier as far as as the customer i mean this all bottles back to the consumer and i think so many different levels what regenerative ag means to me is different from laura different from greg different from you um but but i would tell you the one thing we all have in common is we want to leave mother earth better than when we came into it right and, and we all want to do that within uh within the farming community. One thing my dad said to me when I, I told him that, that I was gonna go on to the ag industry was um, he wanted to be a better steward of the land than what his dad was. And, and you do that by having more advanced farming practices than what we've had in decades before us. <clears throat> you know, when you finally give him permission to talk, Laura, he does quite well. He, he really does. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's... Uh, Greg, the obvious question is, and we're gonna get more into this, how does it work? All right, we just talked about six layers because there really are, okay? There's a consumer that goes to the grocery store or Walmart or Walgreens or name the place and buys something that has a corn starch, corn polymer, whatever. I mean, everything from shoes to soap to whatever, okay? Corn oil. So the consumer goes and buys it and they say, I want to know that this corn oil uh, was, uh, you know, raised sustainably and I'm doing something good because they want to feel good. The consumer wants to feel good. You know, I've said this a long time about Priuses. Priuses ain't really going to change the weather, but the person that buys the Prius feels like they did something good. All they really did was pay about one and a half times the price of a, of a Toyota Camry or Corolla. It's uglier and, and they get credit for saving the earth. And I'm not being mean, but there's some truth to that. That's kind of that same mentality. I want to feel good when I buy this widget at the store that I've done something good. And then that company says, man, this is good for sales. That's true. Um, and then to Greg's point, it's good for recruiting. The people that come to work for company X feel like, hey, we're doing something good. So it keeps coming coming backwards. And it comes backwards to you, Premier. And then you say, we want to be leaders and we want to be able to go to our shareholders and we want to be able to go to our customers and say, we're doing good. Then how did you connect with Greg? How, I mean, bring, bring, bring me the dots together. I'm kind of going backwards from consumer to you. And then how did it go from you to Greg to my farm ground? Yeah, I think we've looked for a platform for a long time as a company of how do you how do you aggregate data and use that data to show that you're making a difference, right? And when we came across to Truterra and starting to develop a platform of what does this look like, it was um, some of our largest customers telling us what they were looking for and us going out and, and trying to research and find out how we found we could intersect those two together. And we found, uh, you know, one of the things that resonated with me was I started straight out of college as an ag major working for a grain cooperative, right? Lando Lakes being a farmer-owned cooperative. Um, 
it was important for me as we were looking at programs to know that you have a company you'll be working with that is that is farmer based, right? And it was easy for me to get behind that and kind of build the uh, the program and from there. So you actually you said if we're going to do this, it's going to be through a company that's an ag based company, not a Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, we we decide we're into carbon programs kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I would tell you from where I sit, it was easier for me to communicate and understand that the goals that, that Truchera had were very aligned to what at least I had personally and what we had done professionally as a company um, in the 25 years that I'd been with the company. How much money? How much money are we talking about? 1.2 million acres. How much money are we talking about on an annual basis? All right. How much money for 1.2 million acres are we talking about? The person is, if you think that I'm the only one that's asking that question, every human listening to this right now has that on their mind. How much money? A lot. <laughs> that's not a number. You know what? Anytime I took a math quiz or a math test in college or in high school, if I wrote down the answer was a lot, they'd give me an F. How much money? Yeah, I think the point is it's it's enough money, Damien, that um, um, we're making an investment in in sustainable ag as we move forward. Right? This is a this is a decision that goes way above where my pay grade is. Um, a decision that goes all the way to uh, the top of our company, and um, it's a decision that that we've made that says longer term, this is not only going to to benefit um, um, our customers, our consumers, but it's going to benefit us as a company. Well, and Damien, too, I, I think I'll put it, let me ask you a question about it, too, and we can start to explain kind of how this part of it works. So you asking me a question? Who's I not in business could. after all? You said I could. You what, can what ask me all the cover, questions you want. What's a cover crop uh, cost you right now? Oh, it's, going to, it's going to depend on the cover crop. That's right. what you're, that's you're going But with an this. average. Yeah, give, give me an average. Uh, it, let's call it 20 bucks an acre. Okay. I think I think you're low. Um, just from what I know, you, you guys know more, but I don't know. No, no, that's fine. Okay. What was your number? 30, I, 50 to 60. Okay. I, I think is a, I think is a fair number. So I, what I want to stress is that I, I let off by sharing that, you know, the, the farmer is our customer. We're trying to connect them to like-minded organizations like a premium that are willing to invest uh, together and go through that. I think what's important to understand that these programs, uh, they, they can't cover the entire cost of your cover crop. What they can do is help mitigate some of that cost and yeah. reduce that risk down to do something that's new to your operation. And, and what you get for that should be, to Laura's point earlier, what the data tells us is that over time, your yield improves, your profitability improves, right. your soil's healthier for when you're going through whatever rotation you've got coming up next. So I, I don't want there to be confusion out there that Truterra is working to cover every dollar of every practice change that every grower is ever going to make, because that just... That, that's not possible. No company can can support that. But what we're trying to do is bring this opportunity to connect growers and help ease that burden to where it doesn't seem so daunting from a financial standpoint. All right. So, yeah, my number is low. I was thinking, what's the bare minimum? I could dribble some oats out there uh, and uh, maybe, you know, uh, get something. <clears throat> but uh, assuming then that uh, that we're right here. And and maybe that might even include the application. Uh, so say fifty bucks an acre. What you're telling me is if I sign up my acres, I'm not going to get fifty bucks an acre from Truterra per year, is what you're telling right. me. But I will right. get something. I will get something toward that. You're defraying. You're defraying, and partially offsetting, but you're not completely offsetting the cost of me to do cover crops. Is that what I'm hearing? Correct. Okay. And Premiant is funding that. But did Premiant, and this is a question for Laura, did you go to Procter & Gamble? Did you go to whoever your customer is and say, you're paying for this? I mean, is it, in other words, is it all passed through or is there investment at every level? I would say we have some customers where it's more of a pull and some where it's a little bit more of a push on our end where we're trying to bring them along on our journey. But in general, our customers are making a conscious decision to enroll in our program. So there is a cost to it, right, for them. We've made the decision to enroll all of our acres, no matter what. But mm -hmm. if then they choose to enroll 
there is a cost to it because they're getting data, access to the data, right? Which is what they need to talk to their shareholders and their customers about their carbon reduction, things like that. So there is a cost element and it's not a, we don't do it the same way with every customer. I mean, there are different ways that it can be structured within contracts or as a standalone, things like that. So it varies. I like it. I, I want to point out that before we hit record, Laura said, I'm probably not going to talk much. This is really the Tim show. And here she is answering all the questions. I like it. Do you then, from the standpoint of the, the money part, <clears throat> you give money to Trutera, Trutera gives money to me as a farm owner, let's say. <clears throat> How does that customer of yours use this? I mean, we know they go to their shareholders and all that. Do you see it? Have you seen them doing it from a promotional standpoint? Have you seen them say, we're partnering with Premiant, Premiant's partnering with the farmer to bring regenerative practices to production agriculture in America? Are you seeing it? We have seen some of our customers talk about it in their sustainability reports. Yeah. So the storytelling aspect of it is definitely valuable. And then the other place we see it that's not necessarily called out as the Premiant partnership, but it's in their carpet accounting. That's a, you know, a lot of companies have these things called science-based targets, right? All in line with the Paris Agreement saying we need to limit global warming, et cetera. And they have to use the data that are that's coming from this program that comes from the growers through Truterra to us, to our downstream customer. It's those six layers you talked about, right? That they're adding up their carbon impact of their supply chain. And that's where it all kind of drills down to that one metric along with the storytelling aspect of it, right? Where there's these great nitrogen programs and there's cover crops and there's all of the above, but to simplify it, it comes down to carbon. To simplify it comes down to carbon. Greg, if I'm the farm owner, which I am, and I want to do this, and this is the thing I always ask, how, what, first off, is it always the same dollar amount or is it depending on this, 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 and this? So just kind of give it, give me the walkthrough from that standpoint. Yeah, there is some variation to it. So it's it's about what that practice change looks like. I mean, there's some of these, as as you, two of you on here know very well, that um, are, are maybe easier than others. Uh, do, having a successful cover crop in a challenging year of weather can be really a, a significant hurdle to overcome. Whereas a nutrient management program might be very simple because you're connected with your trusted advisor, your ag retailer, saying, this is what I want to do, help me. They've got their conservation agronomist that comes to visit you and spend some time and says, we could do these few things, make some sort of reduction, which in turn is going to connect somebody like Alora or one of her downstream customers to an opportunity to say, hey, we sponsored this. I want to be able to understand what difference that made to my sourcing area, as Laura alluded to earlier. And I want to be able to talk about that. I don't want to use that on social media. I want to use that in my ESG report. I want to use it at recruiting uh, fairs at college and universities across the country. Yeah. That's the, the connectivity, but the variance is within the practice change. And it's not all that um, it, it's not all that complicated. I, I think conservation agriculture has been around since the beginning of time. Tim mentioned that, that his dad talked about it, however many years that that was, hundreds of years ago. They still knew that there was opportunities to do better to make sure that their soil was healthy for the next time they were going to plant something into it. So this is nothing new. We're just trying to help mitigate some of that risk and help ensure that it's not done in a way that creates a real financial challenge for a grower. Yeah. So if I am the, the grower or the landowner uh, out here, I, I go to truterra.com slash enroll, which is, by the way, how you go about doing this. T-R-U-T-E-R-R-A, truterra.com slash enroll. Um, how much could I expect to make per acre? I mean, is it, is it, I mean, there must be some average. There obviously is an average. Averages exist. Is it 30 bucks, 25 bucks? Yeah, if you go on to the to the carbon program, it's thirty dollars. So, Damien, the site, the link that you talked about into our carbon program, it'd be thirty dollars uh, today. That's come up from whatever it was when this program first started. I believe it was two thousand nineteen. It was before my time, but you can see what's what's happening and what's uh, driving this cost upward. And then you look at other international markets and see what's happening with carbon uh in europe for example with some of the international or global companies that we're working with I mean, you're, you're seeing carbon trade at, at really significantly higher prices than over here so we we believe that that's coming it's not here yet but i, I think there's you've seen a trajectory of growth with the true program each year 
So, thir- I mean, because th- again, this, the the listeners saying, okay, so I can make, I can about count on thirty bucks, but there's other stuff, you know, nitrogen, et cetera, et cetera. Laura and Tim's customers care about that stuff also. So, what do you think the average is right now uh, in the year 2023? Is it more than thirty bucks? As far as what a grower can expect from a program, yeah. no, I don't think it's more. I don't think it's more than thirty collectively. No. Okay, so thirty is a good number to go with. Dear listener, are you almost as exhausted as me? It took me 10 minutes to get a number out of these people. Again, I never could just write down a lot and, and pass the SAT's mass portion. All right, Tim, you haven't talked for a while. Where do you see this going? You're a farm guy like me. You've got a degree in agriculture. Um, you have been in this industry for 30 years. Where's it going? Where does this go? Yeah, I, I, first of all, it's not going away. That is for sure. And we've made a, um, an investment. We've talked internally within Premium. Um, we want to stay in front of it. So I think as we continue to, uh, to move uh, uh, from generation to generation, um, it is absolutely here to stay. When, when, when Laura and I speak about uh, vendors, potential new vendors, um, one of the first things we talk about is uh, what's your sustainability program? What's it look like? Um, you mean a I vendor to you? You're, you're going to buy you're going to buy widgets to keep your your processing facilities going, and so when that company comes in to sell you something, you make them buy into this. We 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 look at what their sustainability program is, right? Do they have a sustainability program? To me, that is a differentiator um, between vendors on whether you know how they're looking at how we're aligned to our sustainability program, right? So. Um, it's not always about price with us. It's about a longer term partner and how we're aligned um, um, cult- culturally with them, really. So you say it's not going away. Greg, we talked about nitrogen. That seems to be the new thing. I started hearing about it with uh, the Netherlands. I uh, heard about now in Canada. Is nitrogen, is carbon yesterday's news and now it's nitrogen? Or does carbon stay around and then it's nitrogen, then it's the next thing? You tell me where it's going. I think it's, uh, again, it's going to sound generic, Damien, but it's all of the above. I, I think you what you have to understand is to do this the right way to make the impact that people are looking to make, whether it's profitability and yield on the farm or it's I need this data to be able to put into my ESG report. I, I think it's all of the above, which is what I am so proud of, of Truterra as an organization that we've committed to, that it's soil health first. Hey, carbon is the, the sexy thing out there, right? Everybody wants to talk about carbon. Now they want to start talking about nitrogen. But for us, if we're following that all the way upstream to the grower, it's about soil health. It's ensuring that that soil is is going to to perform at a very high level. It's going to drive the yield and the profitability that we're all looking for. And in turn, oh, by the way, you're doing the right thing for the environmental side, which is valuable all the way downstream to that consumer. Laura, you said, uh, by the way, I'm going to ask another question. You said it's valuable all the way down to the consumer. Well, apparently not valuable enough to make it profitable. It's only now partially offsetting. So does it get to a point where it's so valuable that I actually make money on it? Because right now, yeah, I get it. I'm improving my asset. Farm ground's worth $12,000 an acre, $15,000 an acre by participating in this, doing cover crops. It improves my asset. That's long-term stuff. You know, that's like passing on to the grandkids kind of stuff. I still got to make money today. And right now it's not, these programs are not so valuable to somebody that it's actually a net profit for me as a landowner, right? I think it's a great point. And and what you really have to think about is when does it become important enough to the consumer that they're actually willing to pay a little bit more on the shelf? And until that time, it's going to be challenging because you have companies like Premia who are willing to shoulder some of that cost on the front end because they know what's coming and they know what's important to their customers who are going to have to educate their consumers why they're going to have to pay more. I think our retailers at the, you know, the grocery stores are going to have to educate their consumers as well. There's a part that's going to have to be played by every portion of that whole supply chain to help justify this new cost that's coming. But the the corporates of the world have been forced into making some of these decisions on the front end. They're having to lean in and invest. So where does all that, you know, oftentimes we get asked why, why, why isn't more coming all the way upstream? Well, because you have one group in that entire chain that's shouldering almost all of the cost at this juncture. 
and the, one group is shouldering almost all the costs, meaning one, 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 one portion, one layer, one layer. Yep. Okay. This stuff. Now I want to go to the other part. I'm going to be the naysayer or the question asker, uh, the skeptical customer. Um, Laura, this is probably one for you. This is all noise. This is really cool. This is neat. Um, it's also trendy. Trends don't last forever. Tim says it's not going away. I say that, uh, you know, it's, it could be just a trendy thing. You tell me why I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, I would say that beyond just the trend of sustainability, it's about building resilience in the supply chain, right? We know that better soil health increases yield and the profitability of the grower and strengthens the communities, those farming communities, right? I mean, all of those things are better for business, not just for the feel good of the consumer and being able to say they're buying sustainably. It comes down to dollars and cents too, right? We need to be able to have a corn crop that we're able to buy for years to come. Yeah. It's investing in our supply chain in order to ensure that we can be a business for another hundred years. <clears throat> I like it. Uh, data. This is another one. You said you used the word a couple of times, data. Um, what data are you harvesting from me and why do I want you to have that? Or is it, or is it something that I shouldn't want you to have? That's the, that's the, the skeptical uh, skepticism out here. What's the data you're collecting? Yeah, I think Greg can talk to all the metrics that are collected from the grower. Um, I would say our downstream customers are mostly interested in that carbon metric. So Truterra is a bit of the go-between, right, where they're collecting metrics from the grower and able to kind of distill it down to that one number. So from a data privacy perspective, we're not seeing specific farmer information. I mean, we're not even seeing it at the county level, right? We're seeing the 1.2 million acres or, you know, whatever that subset of our customers. Yeah, your, your, your point is it's not it's not down to Farmer Brown's uh, back 40 uh, because then all of a sudden, like, we're going to turn them into the farm police or something. I get it. You're saying it's an aggregate. Greg, right. speak to that a little bit because, again, I'm asking these questions because I get to ask them myself. What are you collecting on me? We're collecting various data points that are going to yield that aggregated factor or set of KPIs that are important to Laura, that are important to her downstream customers. But I think Laura hit on a really important point. We're not sharing Damian Mason's field boundaries to anyone. That's coming into our network. It's being aggregated out. It's sent to Laura in that aggregated format. So I think that you know these are data points that in all likelihood, Damian, you're already collecting on yeah. your operation. Yeah. It's just a matter of, are you writing them down on a piece of paper? Are you putting them in an Excel spreadsheet? Do you have another program you're using? Uh, how's your ag retailer working in there? And I think that starts to speak to the difference of Truterra is that we, we know and understand that it's farmer first and we know the retail network too. So I think what we can take from our partners uh, through the cooperative network and retail to help reduce that burden on Damian Mason of having to put every little bit in there, my purchase data, all of that, we're going to do some of that first, and then we're going to, whatever else we need to help make that, depending on what type of program it is, that, that's when it comes to Damien entering that. But like I said, I don't believe it's anything that you wouldn't be capturing already. Tim, I got a degree in agricultural economics. I like to look at numbers. I like to look at uh, marketplace trends. You said this is not going away. Then Greg said, we need to make sure that the companies are educating the consumer about this, which educating the consumer, I've oftentimes said, uh, we say that in ag. What if the consumer doesn't care to be educated? What if the consumer doesn't, doesn't want to do this? We're dealing with 8% inflation. I keep hearing this numbers coming down. The reality is the center store, let's call it corn chips, are up 35% from where they were just uh, three years ago. That's a real number. <clears throat> and you know what? I'm trying to feed my kids out here. The last thing, I, I, don't, I don't give a damn. I don't give a damn about those acres. I don't care. I got to worry about pocketbook economics. Is there going to be pressure from your customers and their customers on down the line when we've got inflationary times and we've got, uh, you know, in real data, uh, incomes are not keeping up with, uh, you know, the cost of stuff? Is there going to be backlash on this kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, I mean certainly we've seen uncharted waters on inflation here over the last few years. Um, again, I think as we look at what our program is longer term, you know, it is that push versus pull type of mentality. And um, 
we do know first and foremost, we're everybody here on this podcast, we're all consumers, right? We've all filled it in our own pocketbooks when when you go to buy groceries in the store, when you go out to eat, things of that nature. Um, but longer term, if you're truly invested in what we're attempting to do, mm-hmm. and ultimately it's soil conservation and profitability for for the farmer, um, we've got to get past some of those short-term hurdles, right? And, um, you know, I, I, I guess um, I'm just positive in, in the mindset that longer term will win out because that's the best thing involved for everybody. Greg, and I think it's an evolution, Damien. You've asked if it's going away a couple of times, and and I think that no is is the answer. But you know, I also say, did, did the iPhone stay the same from the original model? No, it evolved over time, and it brought more into it. So, oh, mark it down, or mark it down, listener. At the forty minute mark, Greg gave a allegorical uh, and that analo- an- analogy that. Will the iPhone go away? No, but it has evolved over time. Dude, you should host this podcast. Yeah, it's brilliant. You just, you, you just, you know what? You just, it's prose. It's a story. Oh my God. All right. Smart point. Honestly, smart point. Your point is these programs are different now than they were five years ago, presumably, because they were almost non-existent five years ago. Correct. Do Terra didn't even exist five years ago, did it? Correct. As it is today. Absolutely. It, it is it's evolved. Each year it's evolving. Okay. Um, and thank you for reminding me that I've asked the question, will this go away more than once? Because that's what I get asked from people. Okay. The number of acres signed up through anybody, through Terra, I don't even know if Indigo still exists. I, I, I never understood what the hell they did to begin with, uh, but any of these other entities, it's pretty small still. Is it even like, is it even to the double digit percentage yet? Or is it still single digit percentage of the acres in the United States of the 360 million cropland acres? How many of them are signed up? Do you know? Signed up through Trutera or like- Or any, or, any, or all of all of them. It's not very many, is it? I No, I, I don't think so. Yeah. I don't know the answer though. Do you know the acres on Trutera? That we have in the program? Yeah, we're right around 2 million. Okay. Right. And, and 1.2 of them are right here with Premier. Mm-hmm. Got it. So you're their horse. You know what that means, Tim? You could probably negotiate a better deal. When you're the big horse, you can probably go and whip them around a little bit. Can't, is that why you're headquarters right now? Are you there to throw, toss your weight around, Tim? We're always having conversations about that, Damien. And I think it, to, to Greg's point, um, what this program looked like five years ago is absolutely different than what it looks like today. And trying to keep up with with the movements of what we're seeing today and what you've got contra- contractually, um, sometimes it's challenging. Do you have blowback? Do you have, I mean, we talked about the consumer level. Do your customers, I mean, do you have it? Do you, have you had a customer come and say, I'm moving suppliers because I don't agree, agree with this? Has that ever happened? We've not had customers that would be moving suppliers. No, I mean, we have have customers that are more interested in this than others, right? The ones that have been engaged have been pleased. We've certainly had customers that are pushing us along on this journey more so, right? Saying we need different metrics and a new format to keep up with all the new ways that carbon accounting is evolving and things like that. So there are some that are pulling more so than others. Take me a few years down the road. Maybe Greg's the one to ask. Where do we, where, you know, you talked about the iPhone's different now than it was five years ago or 10, you know, even when Steve Jobs was still alive, he'd do his presentations, whatever, come a long way. Where does this go? I I think that knowing that soil health is not going away and the importance of that to Damian Mason's operation, to Tim's brother's operation. I I mean, I think that's where it's going to have to follow some form or fashion of what keeps soil healthy. Yeah. And so whether that be some sort of intervention program that we're working on with practice change, whether that's a nutrient management program that yields some carbon asset or it's this new nitrogen thing that we're talking about, uh, all of that, I think, is going to evolve. But at the heart of that is always going to be soil health. So I don't think you're going to stray too, too far from that whole concept of soil health because you can't. When you talked about there's not very many, I, I don't think, I'm guessing it's below 10% of acres that are in the United States that are in any kind of program, be it, you know, whatever. So if we got to where this remarkable adoption 
happened out here in in my part of the world and in you know cropland area uh and it becomes widely accepted will there be enough financial support will there be enough premiums will there be enough organizations that want to participate to make regenerative uh cover crop nitrogen reduction carbon sequestration will there be enough money i'll ask tim yeah yeah uh, i think ultimately it starts with the consumer right it, to, to your point earlier damien if, if this is a, a trend and the consumer backs off it's going to be interesting to see where does that funding come from right um it, it, it you know, I'll refer back to my my kids in their twenties. Um, they 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 think about the world differently than I did when I was twenty five, right? Mm -hmm. And um, they make purchasing decisions differently than what I did when I was twenty five. And um, it's they're going to have the purchasing power here over the next 10, 15, 20 years more so than 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 my generation. So. Um, I do believe ultimately it starts with the consumer. I do believe that 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 age group is going to put their money where their mouth is. And that's why I think longer term, it's a program like this that's here to stay. But I would add that with scalability, the price will, in theory, go down, right? That's that's kind of how we see it in a capitalist society. So I would hope that cover crops don't cost 50, 60 bucks an acre in 20 years, right? And that we're able to scale this at a more reasonable rate. Yeah, so I mean, the the question, because I, I ponder it and I actually, to be honest with you, I've been asking you the hard questions because I get asked them. I don't think it's going away. I agree that environmental investing was a new thing a decade ago. Uh, you know, environmentally conscious mutual funds, et cetera, became a thing about a decade or so ago. I, I agree with uh, both of your assertions that this will uh, persist. Um, I, I've wondered about whether it gets to where, you know, to my question to Greg, if it's if it's so valuable, is it why isn't it valuable enough that it's actually a profit center right now for the farmer or landowner? It's it's a it's an offsetting, it's a defraying of expense, it's not a complete offset or more importantly, an actual profit center for me to do that. What question did I not ask that we need to cover? What thing did I not did I not pry out of you, Greg, that I need to cover? Actually, and everybody. Greg, starting with you. What what thing? I think you did a fantastic job, Damien. I, I'm a little scared to bring up any sort of, um, you know, comparisons anymore after my iPhone really, really flopped. Well, actually, it's kind of like when you open up when your first book's a bestseller and like you're heralded as like a uh, literary genius, better just to walk away, retire, be done. You know, like once you gave once you gave the uh, analogy with the iPhone, that's probably as good as it's going to get. All right. What what thing did we not cover, Tim and Laura? You were both nervous about coming on here, and I told you it was going to be a good time. It's just a good discussion. This has actually become a very long episode, but you know why? Because I get asked these questions. So what thing do we not cover, Laura, without being a sales pitch? Tell me. I don't know that there's anything that we didn't cover. I mean, I think that the more we can simplify this concept, the better, right? We know that sustainability means something different to the grower than it does to us and our downstream customers. But we all want the same thing. It all comes down to soil health. It's just about how we talk about it. So I think if we can close that gap and all speak the same language, we would be better off. The simplification thing, I guess maybe Tim, this is where we'll, we'll go out and then we might have to bounce it back to Greg. It's not been simple and that's why there's skepticism. It's not been widely adopted because it's not simple. I, if I want to grow corn, I know what it's worth. I can log on my phone and find out what it is on the board. I can see what the basis is in my area. I can truck a load over to your plant in Lafayette. Boom, it's simple. If I want to do this, there's still a layer of complexity and misunderstanding and unanswered questions. That's where, like I guess, it's, it's opaque uh, versus transparent at this point. Is that where the problem lies? Tim? Sorry, I thought you were going for a break. Um, I, th I think it is. You know, you're, you're building the plane as you fly it, so to speak, right? And as that plane gets in the air, you might need a different part. And again, five years ago, the program is completely different than where we're at today. Um, do I sit, can I sit here and honestly say, hey, this is going to be perfect every step of the way for the next five years? No, we're going to have challenges. We're going to have hurdles. Um, but but ultimately, what needs to happen is a farmer needs to see the return 
that justifies him doing this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And and is it gray and murky right now? It is because again, we're we're trying to catch up to the speed of what uh, you know what's being asked, what, what's being requested. Um, ultimately, in order for this to stay, or for companies like us to continue to push it, and for farmers to see that economic return, um, along with with soil health. To, to to keep the program going. Yeah. All right, Greg, you do get the last word here. And I don't mind if it's if it's only half as brilliant as your iPhone uh analogy. <clears throat> is the complexity what's preventing acres from being signed up, or is it lack of buy-in from premiums? I mean, again, chicken or egg kind of a thought there. What thing what 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 do what needs to happen to have it be 20 million acres, 50 million acres, 100 million acres? What needs to happen? And the way you close it out is perfect. What needs to happen, I think, is education. We talked about education all the way down to the consumer level of why they're being asked to pay more and what that means. That same concept flows all the way upstream to where this whole thing starts. And that's what Trutero is trying to help with is that educational piece. We don't want anyone to try something new without fully understanding what the opportunities, what the risk is associated with that. And oh, by the way, alongside that, we're going to mitigate some of that cost to do it, but not without that proper education to do it the right way. Okay. You don't think it you you don't think it's a lack of buy-ins from the premiums of the world. You think it's a matter of you think that the money will be there if the desire to get the acres in a program will happen. I do. I think it's building the supply and you know the whole build it and they will come. I, I actually think that that concept holds true here. I, I think we need to continue to educate and develop that supply and bring that to the, the premiums of the world and others that are willing to uh, step up and, and sponsor our American farmers. I think we're going to leave it right there. And dear listener, viewer, I know this is a longer episode, but it's a good one because I was answering, asking the questions if you've asked me, and I hope I got you the answers. You know what? Actually, let's face it. There was some thoughts. My Mrs. Mason says, Damien, are you sure you want to bring on these people that are your sponsor and ask them hard questions where they give long, awkward pauses? You know, that's kind of like biting the hand that feeds you. But you know what? I did it because I want you to know that I am not a sellout. And so I really appreciate these guys coming on here. And that's Laura Kowalski and Tim Meinhold from Premiant. If you want to learn more about the sustainability program with Premiant, and maybe you are still the skeptical listener to this, can they go somewhere on your website and learn about this, Laura? Yeah, sure. So um, our website does have a little bit of information, and then we have a new uh, impact report coming out in the next month or so that will go a little bit more in depth on our program and our commitment. Okay, so it's, it's premiant, and you better spell that because it's a, it's not an everyday word. Sure, p r i m i e n t dot com. Premiant dot com. Laura and Tim from there. Greg, I appreciate you lining this up. I think it's because I, I plied you with drinks in Omaha that night when I said you've got to get this lined up because I got to answer these questions. So thanks for being on here. And if they want to learn more about Trutera, again, they are a sponsor of my podcast. It's Trutera dot com, and you can go there and enroll. What else do I need to tell them? Anything, Greg? That's it. That Thanks sharp, for having us. That you're a sharp dude and you're you're my second favorite true terror person behind, of course, Mariah. Anyway, till next time, he's Greg. Uh, those people are from Premiant. I'm Damian Mason, and this is the Business of Agriculture. Well, that concludes another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture. This episode was brought to you by Pattern Ag. You know, everybody in agriculture understands the importance of soil health. We also keep an eye on our soil better than we ever did through advanced soil testing. But what if there was a company that provided predictive analytics? Not just checking out nutrients and all the elements that are in there, but also could tell you the degree of risk you face with disease and pest pressure. That's right. Pattern Ag can do that. They actually can tell you, hey, you're going to have a real issue here. You can preemptively, proactively treat for corn rootworm or cyst nematode or sudden death syndrome before the problem actually starts costing you yield. Go to pattern.ag, that's www.pattern.ag to find the nearest rep that can help you start doing better for your soil.